We live in a multiracial and multicultural society. Our diversity has become a strength as we work together to improve our lives. We have made good progress for our different communities. It is not an easy task. It requires understanding of our different ethnic backgrounds. At a time of rapid globalization and societal changes, how can we achieve a stronger social compact? How can we ensure that our minority communities make progress together? Thank you so much for being here with us Pleasure. today. Singapore's multiculturalism mm -hmm. is based on respecting differences, regardless of race, language or religion. How can we further strengthen this multicultural character to ensure Singapore's continued progress? There are many different ways that you can do this. We have framed diversity for the last 50 years based on race, language and religion. But as we go forward, the range of diversity that we will see in Singapore will change tremendously, primarily because we have trade, people coming in to work, tourists, and because Singapore is such an open society. For multiculturalism to work, we must be curious about diversity. If we can begin to appreciate the people around you and inculcate the desire to know from an early age, then you learn to respect others. Diversity brings us strength rather than something that will break up society. Every one of us are equal. We have equal opportunities in Singapore. And that within the common space where we can interact with one another, respect diversity, use it as a guiding principle. Turn diversity into something which is positive for the future of Singapore. I can't agree more with the minister. I came from a relatively protected family and I went to the UK for education. At that point of time, there are so many different kinds of people I hadn't come across before. You need to have a natural curiosity, be very open-minded. But at the same time, remember your roots, the principles that you were taught. Coming from an Asian background, it was very much about studying and working hard. They were showing me a different world. And I think that whole experience for me, being abroad, meeting such a different group of people, which I would have never met, framed a lot of my thinking in my early 20s, which I was then able to bring back. I can totally relate with that. My father came in the 70s, typical German engineer, wanted uh. to build a factory <laughs> and explore the new world. So he did and fell in love with a Singaporean. From his family, that was the most exotic thing that they had to comprehend. Like, why would you go there? We have everything here. But for him, it was the sense of adventure. Growing up here, I had the Asian values at home. I had a wonderful Chinese grandma, Popo, who would cook me wonderful rice dishes with soup and a nice little balanced diet. And then for summer vacations, we'd be shipped back to Germany to learn the German identity. I learned German and French. I'm learning Mandarin now. I speak a little bit of Malay. I like to see that I had the best of both worlds. And being able to have that privilege and living here is so amazing. It, it is really, truly diverse. I'm a big advocate of diversity. My father's Malay, my mother's Indian, and they were matchmaked by a Chinese. <laughs> the first time they met was on the wedding day. So there was a lot of trust in the Chinese matchmaker. The Chinese matchmaker was my father's colleague and my mother's neighbour. Fortunately for them, it was a match made in heaven. Singapore right now consists of many different races, many different cultural backgrounds. When I was growing up, living in a HDB flat, I'm exposed to neighbours who are Indians, who are Chinese. When it comes to Hari Raya, we will send food to their houses. The Pavali will send food to our flat. Mm. I'm in such a privileged situation. I grew up in a kampong. I was the last generation to grow up in a kampong. We moved out in 1984. Which kampong was that? Lolong Chuan. Oh yeah, Lolong Chuan. So back then, in our kampong, we have Chinese, Malay, Indian. There's this kampong spirit that's happening during Hari Raya. Yeah. Like you we said still have now. it when we move to HDB. Right? Yes. yes. Uh, uh, because my parents don't understand English. Sometimes electric bills frighten my parents. We bring it to our Malay or Indian neighbour for help. I was exposed to different culture. And I think many people were very frightened because they weren't exposed. Right now, kampong don't exist anymore. Allow me to use Hokkien. Now, no kampong but God. 
Gamjing, <laughs> which is the Ganjing. In HDB, whenever it's raining, all the neighbors will be helping out and say that, hey, Loho Liao. Everybody will help one another. The parking attendant is coming, then everybody will shout across the block. This very nice coexisting, tight knit, unspoken bond. Well, it's interesting because I grew up in a rented apartment, kind of like the expat life, and then we moved into an HDB. And we're like the Ang Mo's in an HDB block. What I enjoyed the most was the playgrounds in the HDB. Right, I would sure. just hang out and say hi, connect and talk to people. And it was a bit weird for the children at the playground to be so confrontational because in Asian culture, we're a little <laughs> bit more quiet, a little more shy. And you have these brash Eurasian kids going, hey, you want to play with me? I've got another racket. Like, let's just, like, just for five minutes. Like, do you want to be but my friend? But it's great, right? Then they open up, right? Yeah. There is that feel-good factor of being in a community. I think HDBs are awesome because the diversity is there. Nowhere else in the world will you see this. In my neighborhood, activities are the one thing that really brings everybody together. Weddings and funerals. Whenever there's a Malay wedding, you march in, very yes. dramatic. Everyone will be opening up the window, taking pictures. And when there's like a Chinese funeral, my Malay neighbor will ask, why is it this way? Why is it had to be three days? There's communication yes. and interaction, and that creates a deeper understanding. That's the beauty about Singapore. I think nowhere in the world will you have weddings at the void deck. And that's where, like you said, it brings people together. When you have weddings at the Void Deck, it's convenient for you to invite your neighbours to come together, right. to eat, to celebrate. We all need to understand integration, understand different races, tolerance for different cultures. Everybody has a social responsibility to be mindful of what they say, especially with the introduction of social media platforms. Mm. These are platforms where we can address whatever we want to say and not to say things that might ignite unwanted emotions. Yeah, I agree. At the same time, I suppose it's a double-edged sword. Yes. I mean, there are those who use it to essentially just let off steam in whatever <laughs> words they want. Yeah. But it's also the opportunity for yeah. the rest of us who don't feel the same yes. to stand up and say, that that's is not, a wrong view, exactly. that's a wrong thought. Yeah. Singapore is a very open society, mm -hmm. exposed to external influences. Sure. At times, unfortunately, extremist influences. Sure. How can we further build up the resilience in our communities? It's about choices. The way I see it is that you have to keep the population informed. These are wrong ideas. These ideas will bring harm to Singapore. These are the ideas in which we should embrace. It's about educating them because there's a whole spectrum of ideas out there and you cannot block. Ultimately, it's about educating the population on what is right and what is wrong. And that, I think, is a responsibility not just of the government or the state, but of all of us. Killing an innocent life is wrong. Whether you're Malay, Chinese, Indian, Muslim or Hindu is wrong. For the Muslim community, you can go to Muiz, see the Mufti and have a discussion and then he will clarify. And I'm sure this applies for other communities. There are people who think that some of the theatre players are very extreme from their point of view and they don't like it. But do we block them? We don't. As long as it doesn't bring harm to society, we give them a choice, we keep them informed. There is a clear line of what we think is harmful and we will never allow it. In dealing with extremism, we have to be able to draw that clear line. You have to make your own decision, you have to decide what is right and wrong for your family. We have to preserve our national interests. We have to preserve our racial harmony. If any idea that comes in causes us to pull apart, I think that's wrong. Keeping racial tolerance is very important. I was born in Sri Lanka where a 30-year conflict put the country back much more than 30 years. It was at a time actually when Singapore was looking at Sri Lanka that's right, as, a model. as an example, yes. as a model for the fact that it was an open country. Racial conflict has led the Sri Lanka to look to Singapore right. as to how they can rebuild. And it's sad because it's a waste of economic, social value in a world where there is a lot of racial conflict, general conflict. Singapore has racial tolerance. It is open to diversity and people come to Singapore for safety because there is general rule of law and principles that this country stands by. What I appreciate so much about the Founding Fathers of Singapore is that they really thought of building this country almost as if they were building a company. We have teams. We take into account everyone's point of view. It's not our buildings, it's not our port, it's not our airport. These are all infrastructure. Racial harmony is our best legacy over the last 50 years. I feel that community leaders 
inspired individuals need to step up when there are skirmishes that happen between races. It should not be left to the government to say this is wrong. I think there's a very good point that this voice to support has to be just across the board, not just from government and community leaders. We all know that the Malay Muslim community is undergoing certain challenges, not the fault of a community. These are just some people out there with extreme views. Mm. You therefore need the Chinese community to come and say, hey brother, we are cool with you because we trust you. You're part of Singapore for the last 50 years, right? There could be one or two persons who have very strange ideas, but they don't reflect the majority of that community. I think that sense of assurances coming from community leaders of different background is a very important point. Yes. That's right, yes. We need to build certain internal resilience in the various communities to recognise what is at stake, what is important for us, what needs to be preserved. You need community leaders to understand what's the bigger picture. You need teachers to play that role. You need religious leaders to play that role. Therefore, everyone in the ecosystem must understand what is the good of Singapore. Does these ideas make sense? Does it contribute to our greater good or is it going to pull us apart? There is a certain common set of principles that we must continue to preserve. Do you think the Chinese majority has a larger responsibility of reaching out to the minority? I wouldn't community? say larger, but I think all of us have responsibilities which are common, but we also have responsibilities unique to our community. The Chinese community being the dominant community and having their presence in many aspects of our economic life have a special role to play to ensure that their efforts and opportunities to integrate the minority community. On the other hand, the minority community cannot just wait by the side to be called. They have to make the effort upgrade themselves. So you look at the Malays and Indian community, we basically have done well in the last 50 years educationally, producing the talent so that they can offer themselves as part of the economic life. So to a large extent, it is a quid pro quo. We have to work together in tandem. And therefore, if we can do that, I think we have a wonderful model. At the end of the day, it's not about waiting. It's about working towards each other's interests. Minister, my family has been in Singapore for the last 40 years and meritocracy has been pretty much the bedrock of Singapore's progress. The best man for the job, yes. you work hard, you will do well. That's right. But how do we help people from different socio-economic backgrounds? There have been some studies in the West that talks about how inequality can continue to be preserved because of your economic background. Today, I mean, you read in the papers about studies that show only kids of a certain background get into IP program, the top schools and what have you. The economic advantages of your parents can be passed on to the kids and that's pretty obvious. So I think it is the role of the state to make sure that you can level that playing field. We cannot determine the outcome. We're talking about changes to the PSLE. How to make sure that even kids from poor background has the ability to go on to some of the better schools. So to a large extent, I think we need to temper it somehow. We don't upsetting the whole system because it has served us well. I think the principle of meritocracy is still sound, but it has to moderate with some of these changes that we tweak to allow, as you already pointed out, people who come from different backgrounds to come into the system to have that opportunity. You can say bodies like Sinda, Mandaki yeah. are helping in that sense. That's right. yes. How else do you think people from different backgrounds can benefit? I don't believe in affirmative action. You are there not because you are good, but you are there because of a quota. I don't think we should do that. I think the government's role is to find ways and means in which we can help certain communities. For example, Sinda Mandaki is being assisted by the government. What government can do is to allocate resources to certain communities which are disadvantaged and help them to level up as much as possible without changing the overall system. I think that's the way to go. Minister, maybe you can elaborate on what you mean by tweak the system because I feel that equitable access to opportunity is different from equal opportunity. They're two different things. Sure. You know, PSRE and O-level, everyone sits for the same exam. That's equal treatment. But a child from a low-income family whose parents are incarcerated, at five years old, they can't spell, they can't speak. Well, so how do we change equitable access to opportunity? Maybe you can elaborate. Agreed. Government has stepped into the preschool area. We have decided that zero to six is an important area that we want to invest heavily to allow kids, as you mentioned earlier, to have access. At the same time, all schools are good schools in Singapore. We want to make sure that our primary schools are all resourced with the right teacher training. We cannot prevent those who have the means to send their kids to the high-end kindergarten. But we have to make sure that the middle-range kindergarten is able to train the kids well enough for them to be school-ready so that they can compete. I think that must be the role of government and that's what we're doing now. So if the kid comes from a very disadvantaged background, we have subsidies, we have support for them to be able to send the kid to a childcare. And I think with that exposure from zero to six years, I'm sure the kids will be able to do well. We cannot expect everyone to go to the top school, but everyone must go to a secondary school and all our secondary schools are well resourced to train the kids whatever background they come from. And the other thing that we have done well in Singapore is that we have multiple pathways. This is something wonderful. 
I think I'm the oldest around this table, right? <laughs> and I can remember when you're growing up. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> you either go to arts or you go to science, you know, and that's it. Now, you can go to normal tech, normal academic, you can take different pathway, art school, sports school, and then you can even go on to university by a different pathway. I see a lot of Malay kids, for example, landing up in IT, but eventually landing up in the university. The system is designed to allow people to move at their own pace. The fundamental challenge is, are you prepared to study and learn and stay in school?